literature, it, it, it hits something. Like, it, it's not like you've read that passage a hundred times or you've heard that over and over and over, but that moment, it's like, oh, wow, really? Oh, I just said, sorry, I just said one of those moments. <clears throat> so how was your week? <laughs> right? All over the place? Up, down, busy, 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 yeah, there's, there's another message in that. No matter what you face this week, it could have been great, it could have been horrible, God has been there. You just heard me in that prayer just now, because that was, it's been heavy on my heart this week, because no matter where we go, no matter what we are walking through, he's there. He was there in your success this week. He was there in your failure. Whether or not you decide to, to open up his word or, or take a minute to pray and communicate with him, he was there regardless and in spite of us. He's there. Our lives will become more free. They become more open to possibilities when we are engaging God in scripture and in prayer. Not something, I mean, you don't have to make Facebook posts about it every morning, but, you can, but it's between you and him. It has nothing to do with the rest of the world. This is you and him. And when that happens, we begin to hear from him. We begin to have our ears opened, right? Our hearts are changed in some way, shape, or form, and we begin to do things that we may not do otherwise. And when we do these things, or when we are open and we see other people do these things for us, we see God at work. And he becomes tangible. This invisible force, this unseen God, becomes visible to us by what? By love. Remember, do not be afraid. There is enough. And you are enough. So last month we talked about purpose, right? We we had we broke it down and we talked about what it all means. Almost almost but not quite running to the direction of <clears throat> well, what's the meaning of my life? And so we talked about okay, well, if there's a purpose to this, what was the Old Testament purpose? And we talked about Abraham, we talked about God constantly redeeming, right? And we talked about that Jesus has to come, so that way we, as, as, as mankind, we can have that once-for-all sacrifice then. That was his purpose in that big plan. And then last week, we talked about our purpose. No matter what our uniform is that we wear, we have a different purpose on this earth, and that is to be there for each other and to continue to let this, this holy scripture, these these words of God continue to live and move until Jesus comes again. And so as I thought about the, the we were walking through last month, right? I thought, okay, well, what are you going to do in, in October then? How are we going to tie this together in October? And I thought, well, why, why couldn't we talk about what it is that we can do, right? What, what is it that we can do that will unveil or, you know, show us this purpose? And so I was listening to, I was listening to Max Lucan. <coughs> I forget, it was, a, it was a, on a podcast or something somewhere, and, and uh, I think it was Carrie Newoff podcast, where he's talking about, um, he's talking about his church, and they went through, and, and granted, it, it was a very long series, this is not going to be long, it's just the month of October, um, but there was like a 12-week series that they did on the one another passages in Scripture. And I was like, yeah, there's so many places in Scripture where it tells us to insert blank one another. Love, serve, care, forgive. Uh, the, the list is, is massive. It's, it's extensive. But what it is, is it's, 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 it's a set of scriptures where you can actually find commands. 
right? Most of them, uh, some of them come from Jesus himself, or like we were, we were, where we read today, that was a little bit of words to say right there, where we read today, uh, where Brenda read today, how about if I say it that way, where Brenda read today, Jesus is commanding a one another, right? He, he's laying out a command of one another. So he's saying, I need you to love one another. I need you to do this. Now, I, I, I was doing some extensive research when I started this idea of the one another passages. And so uh, I want to make sure I get this right. There, there's a resource uh, uh, in Francis Chan's book, Multiply. There, there's a resource of a, a list. In that list are over 73 different one another commands in Scripture. Some of them are similar. In other words, some of them are versions of love one another. And some of them are versions of serve, or, or guide, direct, uh, bear with one another's burdens, etc., etc. And then I also found another one uh, from Carl F. George in his book, Prepare Your Church for the Future, in which he identifies 59 verses, which we are commanded to do something for one another. That seems like a lot, doesn't it? Most of, it's good, most of it's coming from the New Testament, too. Most of this is, is post-resurrection and ascension to heaven on Jesus' part. And so what we, what we see, if, 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 we, if we take a look at the kind of the way Scripture is laid out, which we did last month, right? God's purpose in that Old Testament, Jesus comes, new covenant, sacrifices his life for us, right? Tells us these things. Love one another one of those things that he says. But then as the church grows and these, these, these disciples of Jesus are empowered by this new Holy Spirit that comes, the Holy Spirit being a person, by the way, can take many forms, but he or she, if you want to call him a she, it, it, it's depending upon, yeah, it just depends on how you want to call it. It's a person. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's not Father, Son, and some mist or something, right? This person, in our, in our grasp of, of what he is, he's here now, and he empowers those first disciples, right? And he sends them out. And they go out, and they start doing exactly what Jesus said, and they start performing these miracles that are even greater than Jesus. He even said that. I'm going to make sure that, that uh, if you're in the email list, I'll send out those resources. Those, those lists, if you want to start reading through some of them this month, you do that. But today we're going to focus in on what it means to love one another. Right? We're going to talk about, next week, we're going to talk about what it means to serve one another. Then we're going to talk about what it means to be kind to one another. It's a little different than love, right? But still in that same concept of being kind. And then we're going to finish October with probably the most difficult thing, and that's forgive one another. Do we really know what it means to love one another, honestly? Think about it. Think about your uh, upbringing, what you've learned about love. Most of us, I believe, and maybe I'm wrong, hopefully I am, we have a tendency to actually make love something that we can get, right? We, we want it to be something that we can grab, uh, something that we can earn, right? We, we almost treat uh, love as a, a reward system. We have uh, societal systems that, that reward us for doing good things, right? Or, or, or loving each other. If we work hard, we get a raise. If, if we are, are a good spouse, then we are rewarded by our spouse in some other way. If we do well on an exam or, or, or homework, we get good grades, right? We, we are, are, we are a, a reward-based uh, people, right? That, unfortunately, isn't actually the love that Jesus is talking about. This love that Jesus is talking about is something that's more of a biblical perspective on love, and it's not something that you can actually earn. 
It's actually not even something that you deserve, but yet something that God provides for us anyway. There are many names for the word love. There's so many Greek names for the word love, right? Uh, eros is that, that romantic, passionate love that you know, a husband has for a wife or, or you have for a, a human being that you know, God has placed that love in us. It's there for a purpose. There's, there's agape. How many, how many of us are amazed people that know the word agape, right? Agape is that unconditional love. That love that, that which we, we do things for each other without something expected in return, same way that, that God does for us. And, and there's one that I found this week in studying, and, and it's the one that I think really truly encompasses the, the, this love for one another that Jesus is talking about. Because of the context that he puts this in today, this is almost more of a fit. Right? Because it's not it's not a love, it's not a love that is, oh, I just love you guys, you don't have to love me back, agape. And it's not a sensual, passionate love, right? This is what the Greek would call storge. Storge. Storge is a family love. A love that takes care of one another. Uh, a love that provides for one another, uh, a love that incorporates you into a communal group in which sacrifices are made for the good of the group. <coughs> that is storge. That is a love that, that goes beyond just unconditional or just passionate or just... This is, this is a love of a family. Not everyone has... Uh, a family that loves them in that way to relate to, though, do they? We have probably the highest rate of blended families that we've ever had in the United States. We have families that are now blended cross-culturally, even on top of that. Uh, sometimes we have families that are just not good. Uh, we have uh, domestic violence, uh, child abuse. We have all of these things that take into consideration that some people aren't going to know what this Family love is. And my fear is that we are slowly losing that love in the United States, here in our culture. And, and what has happened is the church has not been the church, as Jesus directs us in this passage, to love one another. If we were, people would be flocking in, they'd be busting our doors down because this is our family. I was listening to uh, Francis Chan's letters to the church this week, and he described this interaction that he had. And I talked uh, to my to Grady about it, my youngest, and and he said, I, I had this this gang member that came to my church because he, he's out on the West Coast somewhere. And he said I had this gang member that came to my church and, and got saved, and 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 just had no idea what he, to expect, but knew that Jesus was right. This was the right thing to do. And so the hardest part for him was leaving this gang family to be a part of another family that didn't look anything like he expected family to look like. See, this new family that he was welcomed into, well, you, you had to wear the right things on Sunday morning. You had to go to the right services. You had, you had to be in the right Bible study. You, you had to make sure that you were at these certain events because that's where people would see you. It wasn't, that's not family to him. See, family to him was you do whatever it takes for each other. Whatever it takes. And he goes, you know what? I saw Jesus do that for me. Jesus came to me and loved me in a way that my familia, my, my family did. Never alone. Always giving to each other, always providing something for each other. That was this family unit that he was used to. And he didn't see that in the church. Not everyone has this family the same. But this is the way that Jesus was loving his disciples in the upper room in this moment. 
You have to realize, in, in today's text, Judas, even though Jesus knows that Judas is going to betray him, Judas gets his feet washed by Jesus, doesn't he? he even, though, even though Jesus knew that Peter was going to deny him and was going to say, I don't even know you, Jesus sat and washed his feet, didn't he? And even Thomas, even Thomas was in the room. Thomas, the one who would later absolutely doubt everything that Jesus was saying, wouldn't even believe that it was him that was standing in front of him. That same Thomas, Jesus was there washing his feet. <coughs> Jesus knew what was going to happen, and he was doing it anyway because he loved his family. Now, many of us can relate to that type of family. Even though they might hurt us, even though they might uh, do things to us, disagree with us, not always be there for us, whatever it may be, we are always there for each other. Sometimes it hurts, and sometimes we still just wash each other's feet. Jesus is saying that in, in this text today. And I love, if you start at verse 31, I love the way Jesus, it starts, and he says, as soon as Judas left the room, why on earth is he waiting for Judas to leave? He knows what Judas has to do, right? And he knows that, that what he's about to say, it's not for Judas. He's not worried about what Judas is going to do. He's not upset about what it is that's going to happen because of what Judas is doing. But... He knows that he has to make sure that these guys understand what's about to happen. And he tells them, he says, The time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory, and God will be glorified because of him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, he will give glory, he will give his own glory to the Son, and he will do so at once. Dear children, I will be with you only for a little while. And as I told the Jewish leaders, ouch. Right? As I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I'm going. See, Jesus is about to die. He's about to go and defeat death, knowing you can't go there. If you believe in me and you love me the way you say you do, you aren't going to be able to go where I'm going. But I'll come back. I'll come back to you, he says. And so now I'm going to give you this commandment. So in Jesus' absence, right? He just says, you can't go where I'm going. But in my absence, this is what I need you to do. And he says, love each other. Love one another. How? Just as I have loved you, you should love one another. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Time out. You want me to love people the way you love me? Uh-oh. <laughs> that means I'm going to have to look past their faults. That means if they're saying nasty things about me, I've got to not care. That means if they're going to do hurtful things to me, I can't, I can't worry about that. God, why would you want us to have to love people that hurt us? Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. You can, you can look at different translations and some of it will say, <clears throat> it will prove the existence of God. Jesus demonstrated this, this love, this, this family love. He demonstrated it to them. Showed it to them. Showed them how it works. And, and, and he lets us know that our love for each other in this manner is exactly <clears throat> what we will prove to the world that Jesus still exists. How often do we do love with strings attached? Think about it. Don't think about it too hard. But think about it. I, I typically find myself, I, I love people because they, they can do something for me or they have done something for me. That's when love is there. Uh, we, we often find ourselves loving with an expectation 
right? We want something in return. Joy, praise, a pat on the back even, something we want in return, so that's why we love. He knew that we were wired this way. He knew we were made this way. He was there when we were created, right? And so he understands <clears throat> in that moment how the world's going to treat him. And yet, he still sacrificed his life so that all of us would have a chance at this love. Jesus, and I love that this is World Communion Sunday, Jesus' love is demonstrated at the cross. Think about this. Think about what it is that he was putting himself through. The Son of God. He was fully God and fully man. Right? He could do anything. Make it all go away. Wave his hand and all those Roman soldiers would have fallen. All those Pharisees would have dropped out. Instead, we get this other picture painted for us of who Jesus is. Jesus has been battered. He has been beaten. He has been whipped and flogged. He is then drugged out. He's made to carry his own instrument of death. He is then strapped to this giant piece of wood, and he is nailed through his wrists and his feet to a cross. Somewhere in the middle of all of this, Jesus musters up the strength, and he asks God, his Father, who has looked away from him because he can't help him, he has looked away from him, he asks God, Forgive me. Holy cow. Tell me that's not love. That's not a love that is seeking revenge. That is not a love that is seeking acceptance. That is not a love that needs a pat on the back or a cupcake for my birthday. Whatever it is. That love that he is asking us to show each other is a love that goes beyond what it is that is hurting us to making sure that we love no matter what. This love that he is asking the church to have is to stop blaming each other. He is asking us to stop worrying about the things that somebody else is doing. He's, he's asking us to make sure that no matter what we do, above all else, we sacrifice ourselves for the good of each other. That is storge, that is this family love, and that is Jesus. As we prepare our hearts to come to Holy Communion, being one with Christ, I want to leave you with these words from John in 1 John 3, 18-19. He says, Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth so that we will be confident when we stand before God. I don't know if you saw this this week or not, but there was a moment in which uh, Brant Jean stood in a courtroom and addressed his brother's killer. He said, I forgive you. I don't, want, I don't even want you to go to jail, he said. I want you to come to Christ. I want you to know what that love is. I want you to know that he can forgive you. And he asked the judge to give her a hug. That's this love that he's talking about. People will know you are my disciples by your love. That should be us. Amen.